Look, there in the dark, that shape. It's hard to judge size when the only comparison available is an endless stretch of inky dark nothingness. But the shape is huge. Beyond huge. Huge and moving. Huge, moving, and on reflection not just one shape, but a compound, complex set of shapes. Flippers. An impossibly vast shell. And standing on that shell, four elephants perched on their backs, it can only be... Shape, then, is the wrong word. This has every appearance of being a place, more geography than geometry. And this is a place steeped in magic, the sort of place the word steeped was made for, a place left to soak in an octarine infusion, like a tea bag left in a cup so long it... <laughs> this metaphor's getting away from me somewhat. <laughs> Hello, welcome back to my YouTube channel. My name is Rob Edwards, and today it's time for my second piece about magic systems in fantasy books, inspired by the witty and sarcastic book club blog. And today, uh, if you can't tell from that rambling I just did as the opening, we are going to be talking about Terry Pratchett's Discworld. It's a quintessential gateway fantasy. It's a place of wonder, a place of life, of humour, sharp satire, beguiling stories, larger-than-life characters, and a whole lot of magic. Both in the world itself and the way it's described. And yet, interesting, while there are multiple volumes about the science of Discworld, I don't think there is one about the magic of Discworld. If there is, I've never encountered it, certainly. So, I've tried to derive my own rules about how magic works in Discworld. This is taken from many, many rereadings of the books over the years. Although, honestly, uh, only very recently uh, have I reread Eric and Reaperman. The rest are all lost in the dim and distant uh, fog of memory. So, I, if I've missed anything important, uh, bear that in mind. From what I can remember, and from what I read in Reaperman, Three fundamentals drive magic in Discworld. Purpose, personality, and belief. Magic wants to be used. We see it time and again across the series in lots of li little ways. Um, the, verse, the very first character we meet, Rincewind, uh, has learnt a single spell, a spell so powerful that it scares away uh, any other spells he tries and learns. And it spends the entire time that it's in his head trying to get said. But it's not just sort of wizards and witches type magic. Also, the magic of moving pictures, the mysterious globes that appear in Reaper, Pan, Reaper Man. All this magic, once it gets manifested, it needs to fulfill its purpose. It is something that witches and wizards appreciate. The more senior the witch or wizard, the more power they have access to, and the less likely they are to use it. You don't claw your way up the hierarchy of the unseen university without developing a healthy sense of self-preservation, and an appreciation that watting things man was not meant to wot of is just not the done thing. Much better to have a big dinner and then a long nap afterwards. Which is not to say that witches and wizards are fakers in Discworld, incapable of magic. There are plenty of examples in the books where both engage in something which can only be described as magic. But there's always a risk factor to any of that. A chance that the witch or the wizard or the sorcerer might get carried away. Sometimes, literally, the dungeon dimensions are always waiting to grab the unwary and lure them into their terrible horrors. We see several times in the series what happens when magic is unleashed too freely. Calamity, chaos and footnotes are never far away. With purpose... Oftentimes, personality follows. Death is perhaps the prime example of this. He is an embodiment of the most fundamental aspect of life. He has a purpose to which he must attend, 
but more he has, he is a personality. One of Sir Terry's greatest creations, in fact. And one of the most beloved characters in the franchise, which is frankly weird when you come and think about it. He isn't the only example, though. The Hogfather, the Tooth Fairy, uh, the Auditors, again, Reaper Man, the Auditors in Reaper Man develop personalities and then vanish because that is not the purpose of an Auditor. They all have similar roles. And it isn't just the anthropomorphic, anthropom- 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 anthrop- this word is difficult to say. It isn't just the anthropomorphic aspects of reality that end up with personality. Almost anything infused with magic develops a personality. I think um, Rincewind's luggage, for example. Uh, it is animated, but it is also somewhat murderous. The final pillar of magic in Discworld is belief. Now, this most obviously applies to the religions of the Disc, uh, most obviously in the, the pantheon of the gods, large and small. Sometimes all that's needed for something to manifest magical powers is enough belief. Pratchett lays it out specifically more than once. The existence of gods does not result in belief of them. Belief in gods results in their existence. Again, though, the use of belief in magic is not just limited to gods. If you come through the door marked was names, that means you will be treated as a was name, right? Hmm. At the end of the day, let's be honest here, Discworld is not the sort of place where Pratchett spent a great deal of time uh, working out the maths behind his magic system. Magic is there as a tool for him. It is extremely soft, uh, and it can be worked into whatever shape he needs it to be in for the narrative that he is trying to tell. Still, if the specifics of magic are malleable, I think it's clear that the principles that underpin the magic systems in Terry Pratchett's work is consistent throughout. Uh, That's it from me today. Thank you very much for joining me. Uh, Join me next time for whatever pops into my head to talk about. Cheers.